Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Andy Van. I am a stand-up comedian. Uh, I have been told many times to uh, stop making jokes, but I am I am very funny. I am very very funny. Uh, I'm gonna I'm, I produce shows. I do stand-up comedy and I act, and I'm happy to be here. Welcome to the Vietnamese. I'm your host Kenneth Win. Being part of a culture of nearly a hundred million Vietnamese people in the world today comes with a lot of pain, proud history, and privilege. Join me as I highlight and explore the Vietnamese experience from all of. Thank you for coming on. All the comedians have these funny ass openings, man. All the funny introductions. <laughs> I hope well, my my introduction was was very serious. I I take what I do very seriously, Kenneth. Um, I'm a I'm a goddamn professional, Kenneth. All right. So <laughs> these other comedians, you know, they, they 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 think they're doing a good job, but the reality is, I'm I'm here to turn everything on its head. I'm here to bring seriousness to this business. Okay. Awesome. Well, look, <laughs> congratulations on Embarrassed by Night. You took it up to San Jose. I believe it was your fourth show up there. Uh, it, was, it was our fourth show, our second time in San Jose. Um, yeah. Luckily, San Jose has enough of a audience, um, Vietnamese community, so we can we did it twice there. Um, unfortunately, the theater we did it at closed. That's how bad the show was. That's Wait, what, <laughs> well, what do you mean it closed? The shut down after like 20, 30 years, the theater shut down. Oh, but you guys did have your show, though, right? We had the show. We had the show, and we were able to like um, do it and work with them. And it was the show itself was amazing. After the show, two weeks later, we got an email saying the theater shut down. I was like, "Wow, what did we do?" <laughs> like, yeah, <laughs> we ran them out of business. That's crazy. <laughs> That's some funny shit. So, how many people showed up to the show? Um, usually about a hundred people show up to our shows. That's great. That's yeah. great. Great start. Yeah. Um, and that's and we're really proud of those numbers. Um, San Jose is good because all my friends usually come out, and that's um, that's always great for me to to know that I always have a place to go to if I want to go back and do some comedy. Uh, I'm um, a big fan of of your your show, Embarrassed by Night. Uh, I've had Fred Lay come on, Alex Zung come on. I've had uh, uh, other comedians come on from the show. I haven't aired it yet, but uh, mm -hmm. I'm a big fan because I love comedy. Who doesn't? But yeah. even more important is that. It's a showcase of Vietnamese comedians. Yeah, yeah, and that's that's really important for for me to specifically produce a show. It's I want to show how honestly how different we all are. You know, um, we got comedians like you know like Alex, who's a very classic. He's a comedy store guy. He's like very like like just like pure. He's just like he loves comedy so much. You know what I mean? Fred is more like a Bay Area comic, uh, slow intellectual. I'm a little bit in your face. I'm. I don't know what I am, but I, I'm doing it anyway, and people let me do it anyway, so I don't, I don't know whatever I am. But uh, we also have, like, Viet Nguyen, who is, like, um, who's Vietnamese American. That guy's oh, yeah. wrong. Yeah, he's awesome. I mean, he's, I think, yeah, he's one of the younger guys. Who's, who's, he's definitely up and coming. We've been, you know, we've been friends with him since he pretty much, like, he first started, like, right before the pandemic, and his growth has been amazing. He just keeps, like, escalating you know also like the female comedians nicole tran is really funny and uh, rosie tran you know she's been doing it forever and she's an absolute professional you know so like to showcase these comedians and, and these are just the comedians i know in la you know what i mean there's comedians like in texas and chicago and new york we, we haven't been able to showcase them yet so like the show has so much more room to grow and that's like the really exciting part about being part of this you know i hope you guys never stop yeah i hope i i hope i never get canceled too <laughs> <laughs> Stephen Ho has been Stephen Ho was on the OC one of course I love that guy man he's awesome yeah he was just on the podcast a few weeks ago he's badass yeah dude that dude is that dude is just pumping it out he's just really putting out the numbers and he's really uh, he's doing a really really good job with his fan base and he's working on his comedy and it's 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 really I actually knew him in middle school in San Jose oh shit really yeah we, like we uh he was also hot then so it's really annoying <laughs> Shout out to Stephen O, man. Great yeah. Straight up. Yeah. You know, he, we did we did some like math classes together and uh I saw him again in college uh when he was um he was doing theater in college. I saw him in a play. And then uh during the pandemic, the week before the everything got shut down, right? The week before I was doing a show at the Ice House. And at this point it was like it was the best set I had ever had at this point in my career. And I just like I went out and I just like ripped it. And Steven came up and after the show goes, Hey, Andy, it's good to see you, man. I'm, I'm starting to do comedy. Like let's, let's hang out. Let's go to some mics or whatever. I'm like, yeah, I'm down. And he goes, you know, 
I don't remember much from you from middle school. All I remember is that you ate a lot. I'm like, <laughs> come on, bro. Like, <laughs> there are girls here, dog. Like, what are you gonna, how are you gonna do me dirty like that, bro? <laughs> You're like nothing's changed. Yeah, exactly. He's he's still hot. I'm still. I'm, look at my neck, bro. Look how thick this neck is. This is not this is not a normal Vietnamese neck, bro. I look like a hairy finger, dude. This is crazy. This is like... <laughs> so, when did you get into comedy? Um, I've been doing it for about four and a half, five years about. Uh, yeah, I, I started out as an actor, a comedic actor. I was doing improv and, uh, someone asked me if I did stand up comedy and I just, I straight up lied. And I was like, yeah, of course I do. And, uh, <laughs> and they're like, they put me on a show and then I just was like, well, I don't have any material. So I found some open mics and that, that wasn't the first time I did an open mic, but it was the first time I did one in LA. And once that hit, once you start doing open mics with a purpose, it's not, there's nothing like it. There's really, really nothing like it, man. It's, what, it's, do you it's, mean, what do you mean with the purpose? Um, so the, the idea of an open mic is very free, right? Anyone can go up anytime and talk, say whatever they want. Um, so you have most people, especially outside of LA, they just do it just because it's on their bucket list or they do it because, you know, they, they lost a bet or they do it because, you know, they think they're funny and they're not, you know, like, but once you start doing it and you start doing it and working on the craft, you know, saying this is a joke I want to work out, see if it's funny, see what I can change to make it funny, or maybe I'm, it's not funny. It's just funny to me. Once you have that purpose, you have that drive and you achieve the goal of the laugh based on that joke, that is like, I, I can, I feel like I can do anything, you know? That sounds super hard. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, this is what I mean. Um, when we think of comedy, I think there is this very technical side of it. And, yeah. you know, having this idea of an open mic where you can go up and say anything, do anything, feel whatever you want on, mm -hmm. on stage there's really a a technical backbone to this act right you mm -hmm. just go up and if you just want to use it as a place to you know check off a, a bucket list uh, thing you can but more importantly i think it's a place to really hone this technical craft down yeah and so when i think of like people who go on open mics and use it to get better at it, it just sounds very difficult night after night, year after it year. It is. And you have to do it every night. Like you genuinely, at least starting off, you have to do it every single night for a long time before you oh. really get the hang of it. Yeah. It's like going to the gym. It's a mental gym. And it ain't you like know? you just pop in for like half an hour and you get out. You do your thing and you get out, right? You got to sit through some bullshit and you got to sit through <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. To sit through a lot of bullshit. It's so it's funny because it's cool that you know that. That's how I know you've been talking to some comedians, and you you listen to you probably listen to a lot of comedy podcasts too, yeah, right? Yeah. So yeah, there's there's a lot there is a lot of bullshit. Um, I personally believe that that bullshit is part of the process. Mm. Like you have to take eat a lot of shit and listen to a lot of shit to realize the difference between what works and why it works and why it doesn't work. You have to watch good comedy and you really have to watch bad comedy because if you don't, then you're not paying attention. You know what I mean? It's just, it, there's every moment, every set is an opportunity to learn something in my opinion. And I, I, I love taking an edible or just getting hella high and watching bad sets I, like live, like open mic comedians. And cause it's like, wow, I see what you're trying to do and you're bad at it. And it's really funny to me, you know? Okay. So what what is bad? Um, if you don't have timing, if you don't read the room, if you read, if you just have an idea and you're just so tunnel visioned on your vision, or tunnel vision on your idea and your premise, and you and you can't see that it's not working. But even when you're doing that, what you're doing is like, oh, I have an idea that's that's kind of funny. I'm gonna make a joke. I'm gonna say no matter what. I saw a guy, oh man, he's like a TikTok famous guy. He's, he's random. I think he's, I think he's Italian in the East Coast. And he, he booked out the whole room for his first special. And he had just started doing comedy. That's a big mistake. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. But the room was packed. 40, 50 people, people. You know, yeah. That's all his 
you know, social media fans. fans. And it was a free show, so we packed it out. And me and some, like, you know, actual comics who've been doing it for a while were sitting in the back. And we're like, we, we have to see this. We have to see this. <laughs> we got to watch this train wreck. Yeah, we had a friend of ours open for him, and she murdered. She just did, she did everything a host or a guest or opener was supposed to do. She's a pro. And and then he went up, and the first thing he goes, he gets to the center station, he goes, so I was raping this bitch oh. the other day. And oh. dead silent. Dead silent. He did not read the room at all. He just thought he had this funny idea. And and he's he re- was recording it, and I think he told me in the video you get to hear everyone dead silent and me in the back going, oh, "All right, <laughs> oh baby, let's go. This is gonna be a train wreck." <laughs> Holy shit! And then, so how many minutes did he do? He did thirty minutes of that. Zero laughs. I mean, you could hear you could hear hair falling through the wind, and it was, and. No, but people were turning like, "What is happening?" Um, and and me and the comics are in the back, just I'm dying every time he tries to. I'm like, I can't believe he just gets worse and worse and worse. I'm like, I can't believe that you're doing this. This is this is what people uh, outside of comedy don't talk about much. Is like. You just can't like go from one platform like TikTok and do these videos and, you know, they garner a lot of a million views and you keep doing that right. And then you can't just laterally move over to stand up comedy because it's a totally different platform. Exactly. And that's the that's the great thing about Stephen Ho is that he's putting in the work. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah, he's putting he's trying to get up as much as he can to get as much stage time as he can. He's getting better and better and better. And that's that's. Not something I've, I've seen so many TikTok, Instagram famous people try to do stand up. And it's, I, I am a growth mindset kind of person. So I'm like, okay, you just haven't put in the hours yet. You yeah. can't, it's not transferable. You just have to put in the time and you'll do it. And even Stephen Ho, when he first started, I'm sure he was still trying to figure stuff out too. You know what I mean? But um, over the course of the last like two or three years, he's, you know, he's gotten better because he's put in the time. And that's the thing about these like singers, podcasters, comedian, what, whatever we are doing, I think in the past with our generational sort of like advice that we're getting from our parents and the people that went ahead, it, they just don't realize that these things, these arts take decades to yeah. really get use. Like Chappelle started when he was a teenager, right? Yeah, yeah. His mom was taking him to comedy clubs when he was like fucking 14 or some shit. Yeah. And it took him at least a decade. decade. I mean, he's one of the greatest of all time. So it took him at least a decade to get notoriety as a stand-up comedian. He was already really good. But in order to be considered worldwide good, I mean, I don't think – I think people recognize his talent, but the world wasn't able to recognize him for at least a decade. You know what I mean? And that's the thing. Uh, You know, I think – all of these things are hard because nobody's going to pay money to go see some seventh year or eighth mm-hmm. year comedian or singer songwriter when they haven't done their, their really pay their dues. Yeah. It, I, it's hard. Yeah. I even feel like I'm on my third year of podcasting and I don't get this shit sometimes. And I'll listen back and I'm like cringe, you know, like listen to yeah. my questions and listening to the way I'm forming thoughts. And I'm like, yeah, Fuck I, I listen to your podcast and I think the same thing too. <laughs> Why don't you send me notes, bitch? No, I'm just kidding, man. You, you're doing a great job, bro. You're doing a great job, man. <laughs> but I would appreciate notes if you ever felt that way, though. No, you're. I mean, you're giving me notes, man. Look, at, I'm I'm sitting on a I'm sitting on a plastic stool, bro. Look at the stool. Look at my stool, bro. I'm sitting on a stool doing this podcast. You want me to give you notes, bro? Look at it. Look at I'm holding. What, what am I doing, bro? This is my bathroom, bro. I never use this pull-up bar. What am I doing, bro? This is the beauty of podcasting. We just do whatever we want, say whatever yeah. we want, and you know it's free form, right? But yeah. it, it it does require a sense of authenticity, a mm-hmm. genuineness that comes from both of us, and just being ourselves. Because sometimes I can't be myself with some guests, and then sometimes like with you, I you know guys like you, I'm like I can just say it. Yeah. Want. And you can say whatever you want. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I don't. I don't like it, but you can say whatever you want. <laughs> as long as you don't judge me. No, I, dude, I'm the last. I'm any comedian who's. Oh man, I hate when comedians are judgmental. It's like, dude, we tell dick jokes for money. <laughs> like, why would we sit and judge anyone else? We're we're like we we refuse to be part of this society. We cannot 
be the judge you know like we're, that's not it's not doesn't make sense i think there's a, you need to be humble to be really good or i do i need to be humble to be really good i don't know about other people sometimes people are like it's just like fake confidence and they do it i i, I have to approach things like very slowly and methodic i'm dumb i'm dumb i gotta <laughs> i gotta like trick them Look, I, I don't want to offend uh, all the Vietnamese comics out there, but I mm. do want your opinion on the five to ten of the guys that you or the girls that you think are really. You trying to get me canceled? You... <laughs> no, <laughs> you, it's a trap, bro. <laughs> uh, because you're you 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 know you are definitely one of the guys that are in this world of the Vietnamese comedians here in America. I just want your opinion, or off the top of your head, off you know off the cuff what who are the top guys numerically speaking or uh, objectively speaking who who have the biggest audiences in the united states right now uh in my opinion yeah. the top vietnamese comic right now is robin tran okay she's yeah. the, the trans person right yes yes trans yeah person. yeah yeah um i mean she yeah her her joke writing is brilliant her her she doesn't give a fuck. Like she's going to say what she wants to say. You know, she's just highly, highly technical too. Yep. Yep. She, she's put in the hours over the years. Um, I didn't know her before she transitioned, but even then uh, one of her jokes came on my radar when she was just doing an open mic before she transitioned to like years and years ago. Hmm. So she was, she's been doing it for a long time. Um, that's, Robin that's, I, I, like I, I I can't recommend her jokes enough. I I sent her special to friends. Um, I DM'd her to get her on the show. Like I DM all the comics, but I think she's I think she's too popular now. Yeah, and yeah. Um, and that's okay. That's not, I'm not like mad or about it. I was like I get it. It's you know the, it's part of the game too. Like you're not gonna. I don't think she generally does Asian shows. So and that's and that's fine. That's it's, another uh, thing I want to talk about too is Asian yeah. jokes. We'll get, we'll uh, try to get to that in a little bit later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Robin Tran, who else you got? <sighs> There's a lot. Um, I mean, we mentioned uh, we mentioned just my friends, but let's let's talk about the people I haven't mentioned yet uh, across the country who I think are really good, like up and comers as well. Um, there's Jerry Tran out in Chicago, who um, is. You know, he's open up. I think he's open up for Ronnie Chang. I'm not sure, but he um, he's he's really dry and uh, he approaches comedy very seriously. And it's it's so funny. Um, he I think he yeah, he's he's I think he's from Houston, but he's in Chicago right now doing comedy. Um, Victor Tran is also really good. He's out in New York, but he's also another Houston guy. And these guys are both half half Vietnamese. Um, and I think they're half Mexican. I don't know. I don't know what I don't know what the half is. I don't care. I don't care what it is. I don't care. It's Tran, Victor Tran. And then Mike Nguyen. Mike Nguyen is out in New York. He's been doing it for a minute. And he started out with like he started out on the West Coast with Shang Wang. Um he said he remembers going to one of like Shang's like open mics or something like that back in the day. So he's been doing it for a while and they're out there doing great things out in New York and the Midwest. So I want to shout out those guys too in, in those areas who they may not have like a lot of like uh, like west coast presence but they're they're great at what they do they're great joke writers they're fun they're, they're cool guys too yeah mike came on a, a few weeks ago uh he's a great guy yeah yeah mike is uh funny and you could tell he's really uh thinking about his comedy in a way that's uh yeah. long term and mm -hmm. approaches it on a very uh again i respect tech technicians you know when yeah. jujitsu comes to yeah. comedy it's all about the technical aspect of what people are doing. You know, yeah. when you can see that it, 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 it looks like it's very uh, seamless and it looks like effortless. Yeah. Perform. Yeah. He's yeah. Mike's a pro. He has really sick tattoos too. He's from orange County. That's right. That's right. Yeah. 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 He, yeah we tried to get him on the show a couple of times, but the timing didn't work out. He wasn't like home at the time. So, yeah. but he's ba based on Brooklyn, but he's been out there for a minute, a good decade or so. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, he has a kid now. So yeah. Yeah. I, I think he just got a kid from material, man. It's, it's kind of messed up. <laughs> it's not fair. I got to get married, bro. I got to get I got to get some children so, so I can work on my material, bro. <laughs> so, he, um, you know, he opened up for Ronnie Chang as well. Mike did. Yeah. Ronnie is great. Ronnie Chang is great at that kind of stuff where he's like really, really generous with his guests and openers, you know? Oh, really? 
Yeah, he's he's put a lot of people uh, like just by recommendation. Like he's oh. put he's at, let people up five, like do five or do ten here and there. But those are those are things that Ronnie is known in the Asian American comedy scene as just just an absolute generous and cool guy. Oh, really? Wow, that's yeah. amazing. His wife is Vietnamese as well. Oh yeah, that was my next person. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, she doesn't do comedy, right? No, she doesn't. Oh, uh, yeah. Dr. Ken Jong's wife is also Vietnamese, too. Vietnamese, yep, yep, yep. Yeah. We, we had a Vietnamese uh, podcast party, a big event for LA uh, inter- people in entertainment uh, mm-hmm. in, the film, in the film side. And Ryan- yeah, thank you for the invite. Man. I'm just fucking with you. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't care. I don't care. I don't care. <laughs> You know, I was I was counting on Fred to say, "Hey, can you uh, let Andy know?" Were you no, he, uh, Fred mentioned it, and I was busy. I was busy, but I just uh, I, just, I would fuck with you, uh. <laughs> Andy. Next year, next year, we got we got you next year. Okay. No, you should you should purposely like um, not invite me next year. <laughs> <laughs> we we had Sandra O oh come out. Oh man, that's awesome, dude. Yeah, was, that's awesome. It's a pretty cool party. Yeah, I, Fred said Ronnie was there too. Sandra said the cast of the sympathizer was there too, and everything. Yeah, yep. yeah that, that, I mean that looked really fun. I wish um, you were invited. I wish I was invited. <laughs> <laughs> we had uh, the host of Paris by Night, Goki Yuin, come out. Oh, she's awesome. She's, cla- she's classy. Awesome. That is a classy Vietnamese lady. Yeah. Next year. Next year. We'll, we'll... <laughs> next year. You see the pictures next year too from home. <laughs> Oh, shit. So you have a show coming up in our own backyard, Monterey Park. Yeah. 626 Laugh Market. 626 Laugh Market. How yeah. Did that come up? Um, so one of the guys, so there's a venue, uh, the venue we're working with is a gorgeous venue. It's a beautiful restaurant. They, they're trying to um, increase like their like events there. And uh, one of the guys who owns like the restaurant also in that area is friends with the event coordinator who also knows Stephen Ho, who said that Fred and Andy put on this good show. So we kind of partnered with them to, to like work and advertise and network and everything like that. And once we got like kind of the game plan down, Fred and I were like, all right, let's get to work. We know how to put on a show. We started booking the comics and hopefully we're going to be a monthly show. I think a monthly show first weekend of every month. This is the goal, but this first one's coming out March 10th at 9 p.m. Doors open at 8 and uh, it's going to be awesome. The lineup is awesome. It's mostly Asian comedians, um, but we're going to obviously be expanding and expanding. Um, yeah, I uh, want to bring up this idea that you are you, – you, so it's you and Fred put this together, right? Yeah. Which is brilliant because the names of the two shows that you are have been organizing is very intentional and deliberate. Uh, Embarrassed by Night is a Vietnamese – parody or uh, the title is based on mm-hmm. Paris by night and embarrassment. Yeah. I, I just need to literally point that out for everybody yeah. because it is a very smart plan words. But now what I also recognize, cause I'm in this next world as well mm-hmm. is the six, two, six laugh market, which is a play on the six, two, six night market. Mm-hmm. All right. And that's, and that's all Fred. Brilliant. And here's where I am going to make the distinction is Embarrassed by Night is a Vietnamese platform for comedians. Mm-hmm. And then the 626 Laugh Market, it sounds more Pan-Asian because the night market yep. is Pan-Asian. So you can yep. now cover both uh, both fields, if you will, yeah. uh, very clearly. It, there's a yep. branding intention behind this. Absolutely. We, 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 we you know, brainstormed a lot. We put a lot of time into meetings and working out details of what our goals are and um, – yeah, the intentionality is is the name of the game here. We got to know what we want to do and then execute. I yeah. can't wait. Yeah, I, I can't yeah. wait um, for this to go down because it's literally I can walk to that place from my house. Really? I, I live down the street from Atlantic. That's awesome. Right off Atlantic. Wow, that's awesome, man. Yeah, yeah I can't wait to not invite you. <laughs> I'll pay, man. No, I'm just kidding, bro. You in, dog. You in, bro. Don't even trip. You in. Don't worry. I got you. I got you, dog. Thank you, <laughs> Me and my plus 30 homies. Yeah, yeah we roll deep. Vietnamese people roll deep too, dog. We... <laughs> how, how, big, how big can the place hold? Uh, it's Right now we have 80 seats, but um, I'm thinking we might have to open up the overflow area, which is unassigned seating. Um, but if we can get 80 in there, that's going to be perfect. 
Okay. I mean, let's talk about the marketing side of this. How yeah. much do you and Fred know about marketing and what do you do to market a show like this? That's a very good question. A little bit of inside baseball here. Uh, <laughs> I don't want to reveal my secrets. I want to make it seem harder than it is because it's not that hard. But <laughs> but if I tell everyone I'm a really good producer and I'm a, I'm a pro at marketing, uh, maybe maybe they'll, they'll enjoy my comedy more considering how much work I put no, into you it. You guys do kill the production because I've been to you know a, uh, one of your productions and I love it. But I yeah. always worry that when event organizers put together things like this, it's like – the marketing side of things, you know, I question, I always question, I was like, how do they market this? How do, do they know what the mechanics um, are? And each, I, I want audiences to know what, how yeah. these things are, are marketed. Um, at this time, each show we do, uh, we approach it differently. So we haven't, um, we've been, we've been on five, six shows right now. And um, there are some shows that we, that are, there's a lot of overlap, the same things we can do. And there are some shows that we have to uh, market based on the audience, based on the city, the location. Um, so this monthly show is a completely new beast. Because we want to have a recurring uh, show, we need more data monthly, right? So we uh, have employed specific strategies with uh, like discount codes, and um, we are doing... Um, like we're, we're doing groundwork, like we're, we're going to be putting up posters and putting up a code on that poster to get information to see if the posters work. Um, we're working with Bobaful and SGV Eats, the Facebook group, the popular Facebook group. Um, and they are they also are going to be helping us with marketing. And we have a marketing budget now with private companies and sponsorships. So oh, for great. the monthly show, because it's ongoing, we need to dedicate a little bit more resources just so we can have like a, um, like, so we can have like a structure for every month and just like boom, 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 boom. Yeah. As opposed to embarrassed by night, it's like we have to get the venue first, see what, um, what the location is, what the audience is like in that area. And then we approach marketing uh, bespoke to that specific show. Does that make sense? Yeah. Makes perfect sense. Um, yeah. but what about digital marketing? Do you guys pay for ads for Instagram or Facebook? We have some uh, homies who help us out. Uh, SupDoc has posted our stuff. Um, we use, uh, I, I personally like using um, like um, popular Vietnamese Instagram people. Um, because they're down for the culture, you know what I mean? Like they're down for the culture and they, they, they're they super supportive. And um, Jackfruit has posted uh, some stuff. Neck Shark, I don't think does stuff like this. They're a little bit more serious, but I'm trying to get them. But but I'm also, um, if anyone in your in your audience is listening, like if they are, um, if they know some profiles uh, that I can ask and work with um, to market our show, I, I'm, I'll gladly uh, use them. I would gladly use them for my benefit. <laughs> I like that. Just yeah. straight up. And and the yeah. reason I like to talk about this stuff is because um I normally feel I, I feel that normally these events uh, require so much effort in the marketing mm -hmm. side, the strategy of letting people know uh, because you kind of have to keep seeing these flyers for the same event over and over and over before you're like, wait a minute, I need to go to that. Cause yeah. your brain doesn't record one or two times that you see it. You have to be bombarded with it. And you're like, okay, I'm going to be open. And then you might not go to the first one, but the second one, third one, your friends start talking about, it, and then you start to show up. And mm -hmm. it's important that we support this kind of stuff because when the audience shows up, then we have something tangible in our community that we can prove this is a business model that works. This is yeah. people show up to this. Yeah. And so I, I'm here to promote it. I, I want, I want this to grow. Even if it's yeah. not hundred percent Vietnamese, but Vietnamese brothers, you know, together. Yeah. I got, we got a middle Eastern guy. He's cool. He's cool. He's cool. <laughs> it's, important. it's so important to get this off the ground, you know, embarrassment night, six to six laugh market. Yeah. These are fucking milestones to me, you know, Miles. Oh wow, that's 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 really kind of you to say. That's way nicer than things I've been saying about you. And that's really, <laughs> I feel really bad now for this shit talking. No, I've been doing. no, not not the shit talking that you did, but fucking Fred I, <laughs> at, the, at the Huntington. <laughs> I was sitting in the audience. He didn't know me at that point. Fucking, ri r fucking going off on the Vietnamese podcast. One of the posts for touching toe. I was like, what?
I thought it was great, though. Yeah, that was fun. And that, that bit was, um, mm, okay, that was fun to do. We like to be informative. Like, that's part of the thing that Fred and I um, not struggle with, but we, but we, we uh, sit with a lot is how much of the Vietnamese culture can we push before it's either too much or it's, like, too informative and not funny enough, right? We have to find the balance between, like, what is entertainment and what is too much information. See, you know? that's the thing about Asian jokes. Now we're going to go yeah. back to that. A yeah. Asian jokes to me, for the most part, I don't know why it doesn't work for me. Whenever yeah. I see Asian dudes doing Asian jokes, yeah. it's hard for me to like, it's just hard for me to like, uh, and it's not because we're making fun of Asian people. I don't mind getting made in front yeah. of, but it's always, I guess there's not a wide enough range of variety of viewpoints that are showing how you know the different angle camera yeah, angles yeah, of, yeah, of, yeah. of the asian community it's very yeah. stale to me sometimes and that's I, I no i i get it man i get it and there's a time where when i started watching comedy i refused or i couldn't really enjoy asian comics yeah and then and then i watched shang wang and he like i was like okay this is i can see the craft of comedy through him and then now when I see an Asian comic, I don't necessarily judge things based on like, is it familiar or not? I base, okay, how well did he land his mm. premise or she right? or they fucking whatever, yeah, whatever. <laughs> how, how well did they land their Be premise? Be careful, Andy. <laughs> ah, cut this out. Cut it, cut it out. Get it, get it. <laughs> cut, cut, cut this out, please. Please. I'm just starting my career. Please. <laughs> Yes, yeah. um, I, I have yet to watch the Shang Wang special because I heard he's like the best. He's probably top five all time for me, especially right now. Right now, he was the first comic I saw live in person, um, like years and years ago. Um, and and that, on that same show, I saw Ron Jasal, who is a Filipino comic who I've done some shows with. He's also really funny. Um, yeah, a lot of, I mean, the guys have been doing it forever are going to be the best, you know, yeah, that, that's the hands down. That's the yeah. way it goes down. Yeah. The more hours you do in any business, that's, you're going to just trample. Yeah. Unless you're a fucking idiot. And right. in which if case, you're, if you're an average guy and you just do the hours, you will yeah. get to be like Kobe extraordinary. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I thought Kobe. Oh man. I talked so much shit about Kobe and then he died and I was like, damn, there goes all my shit talking. <laughs> so I also mourned his death, just like everybody else. <laughs> As you laugh about it, you're fucking so irreverent, man. I'm <laughs> sorry. You know how many Kobe fans are on this? Uh... Yeah, we're in LA, right? I got to be careful. I, you know, I live with all Laker fans my entire life. All my housemates have been Laker fans, and yeah, they are so annoying. It's made me hate the Lakers. That's that's the only reason. It's a reaction. It's but not – I don't actually – that's like all fans, though, and in any team sports, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah, it's just like unlucky that I just keep living with Lakers fans. You, you know, that's all, that's all it is. Yeah. So it's a, it's a really bad idea for me to be doing comedy in LA and hate the Lakers. It's it's not good. Yeah, it's been very tough for me. That's the reason why I'm not getting booked. That's the reason why I'm not getting invited to to parties. Right. <laughs> you check yourself. I gotta check myself a little bit. <laughs> so what what do you what do you think is the primary goal of the two shows for the next decade what what is your intentions and what is your like overall goal for these two for embarrassed by night and for um for 626 laugh uh, market um i want to i want to create a space and get especially embarrassed by night to a national level that's that's my goal just so we can elevate Vietnamese and hone and continue to hone Vietnamese American comedic voices. Love your answer, man. I, I want that. And if that doesn't work, money. I just want a lot of money, one or the other. I yeah, I think that that is a worthy endeavor. I don't think there's anything wrong with f f wanting money. I you think, but I, I think if, if money were my primary goal, I would be miserable. I would be absolutely miserable. If, if I did this for money, I would just, I would just be so anxious and angry all the time. But I do it because I, and this is kind of like, this is a little bit, I don't know if it's lame or not, but I feel called to do it genuinely. Yeah. Like, I feel like I am, I am given a specific set of gifts 
and and talents. And if I don't utilize those things, then I have fallen short of what what I I would hate to be my parents if I did not do that. You know what I mean? <laughs> my parents already hate me, but I, but it's, it's a completely different thing. <laughs> it's uh, the drinking. But my parents hate me because of the drinking. It's not not because of my potential. <laughs> do, you, do you drink when you're on stage? Uh. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes, yeah. Sometimes I've done. I've had really bad experiences. Um, not uh, in terms of like like hurting anyone, but just like bad sets because I sl- I start to slur, and that that uh, hampers timing. If anything, because of comedy, I I have been able to control my drinking more. Um. So, but but what happens is after my set, I start to I drink. I make up for it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's not good yeah. for my liver. But I can imagine how much it calms nerves when you get up there. Yeah, I'll do one or two. I'll do one or two before my set. But uh, if I'm not, if, if I'm not careful, I, I don't. I don't want to let it affect my work. You know, I have, I have a goal. I have a like. I I work very hard on the craft. Um, I work very hard to make it seem like I'm not working very hard on the craft. <laughs> yeah. Like to be like to go and present myself in a way that you don't even fucking know what's gonna happen. Cause I don't maybe I make it seem like you don't I don't know what's gonna happen. You know, like it's it, it's a lot of work, uh, and and alcohol will can can derail it, but sometimes it's fun too. So it depends on the set. Um, I I try to avoid it. Uh, I definitely don't. I I started doing edibles and smoking weed recently, and I definitely do not do that before a set. Yeah, because that, would that cripple you. Yeah. I'd probably have more fun, but I would probably do less well. That's but it. I'm I'm sure there's a lot of comedians that go up high on weed. Yeah, yeah. I'm not there yet. I think I'll get there eventually. I think just just because you start to, um, if you can get over the in like the introspection of like, I get a little bit of anxiety if I smoke too much. If you can get over that and just like follow your thoughts and trust your instincts on 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 any on any drug really. The comics are now going up like with shrooms, like. Yeah, and and it's sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But we're 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 slowly trying new things here, and we're always trying to push boundaries. And sometimes we discover things on stage in a different state of mind. And when we discover it, we can reuse that. Yeah. It's called writing on stage. Sometimes you write on stage, and so when you are able to put yourself in a corner, um, like like linguistically, if I go up the joke, I know it's not going to work, but I force myself to do it. And then get to that point, I want to see what my brain comes up with in that moment. And sometimes it works. 90% of the time, it doesn't work. But at 10%, I keep and I move it on to the next one. What do you think you've learned about yourself after you started this comedy journey? I definitely have an alcohol problem. Uh, <laughs> I'm definitely starting to affect things. Uh, <laughs> That's some funny shit. Yeah. Uh, I, I've learned to, I've learned about my strengths, and my weaknesses. Um, I have become more self-aware about how I present myself. And the more self-aware I am, the better I can control my image and how I am perceived. And the more precise my comedy can be. Um, so that's what I've learned. Yeah. Um, it, I mean, it's, it's narcissistic, right? But I spent a lot of time looking at myself, listening to myself, you know, uh, and that, <laughs> for better or for worse, that leads to a lot of reflection. Yes. So that allows me to grow and uh, apply that to other aspects of my life too. So what does it mean to be Vietnamese to you? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're a goddamn professional, Kenneth. You're, that's what you are. <laughs> Look at that. That was slick as fuck, bro. Good job, man. <laughs> I'm proud of you, bro. I'm proud of you. <laughs> You're like BTS, bro. Smooth like butter. <laughs> I was winding that shit up for you, brother. Good job, man. Good job. <laughs> Vietnamese. It's an ongoing question. It's it's a it's being Vietnamese um, in America. That we have the privilege of our identity and how we uh, how we approach it. We we have the privilege of changing. Right, because so many times um, when we think of what an identity is, we think that it is set in stone who we are. But the reality is nothing about us or anything is set in stone. Every change in time comes for us all. 
who I am right now is not who I was even like an hour ago, 10, 10 minutes ago. There, there are imperceptible changes. And being Vietnamese growing up was meant one thing. It meant oftentimes like not understanding. There was like a denial, like not liking being Asian because I grew up with mostly white people in like elementary school. And then being embraced by the Vietnamese community in middle school and high school. I'm like, well, now I, now I am fucking Vietnamese. You know, like now this is all I want to be. And then approaching it now, seeing people from Vietnam come over later in their lives and, and um, being friends with people who grew up in a communist regime or what I was perceived a certain way, like it changes, it changes my pride for being Vietnamese. I'm always going to be proud to be who I am, where I come from, right? But that interplay and that relationship with the motherland and the current land, right? Like that. That relationship, because that relationship has changed, my identity with myself has changed. My final question. Now, mm -hmm. you're the first person that I've – now I'm going to start incorporating this question. Mm -hmm. What do you think the Vietnamese experience – how has it informed the rest of the world? Mm. That is a good question. I think that the Vietnamese story is on a global scale, on a global scale, the Vietnamese story, we are not always going to be defined by the war, right? But that was the first time the world paid attention to us. So that is the initial impression. And almost 50 years later, Vietnam means something else now, right? It, it doesn't necessarily mean, you know, guerrilla warfare. It doesn't mean napalm. It doesn't mean monks burning themselves. It doesn't mean, it doesn't mean tragedy only anymore. To Vietnamese Americans here, sometimes we can get caught up in that because, of course, we, we felt it firsthand. So we know exactly what it was in the 60s and 70s. But in the future, as Vietnam continues to progress and the Vietnamese people abroad continue to pursue arts in their in their like respective global communities, like taking that tragedy, transforming it and combining it, infusing it, it's gonna create something like magical. That's exactly what we did to the French. They came in and we took we kicked them out and then we took their food and we made something magical. You know what I mean? That's what I'm doing right now. I'm making comedy fun. That's what I'm doing. <laughs> awesome, so. man. A great answer. Thank you so much, Andy. I will be seeing you March 10th uh, in Monterey. Oh, yeah, man. DM me for tickets, Doug. Oh, also for everyone, 626laughmarket.eventbrite.com and use code Andy for $5 off. I want to see how good my marketing is. Use code <laughs> Andy for $5 off. <laughs> Awesome, man. Andy, I can't wait for the show uh, to see you. And uh, thank you for everything that you're doing in the comedian world for uh, the Vietnamese. Awesome. And I, thank you, you, man. Thank you for everything you're doing for the com uh, community as well, man. This is a really good, amazing platform. And this is not something we had before. And like whatever happens like with Vietnamese people, your career and our careers are always going to be intertwined. You know? Absolutely. So. Absolutely. And it's a pleasure and an honor. Thank Same, you so much. bro. Same. All right, brother. All right. Thank you for listening to The Vietnamese with Kenneth Wynn. The Vietnamese is produced by Brittany Tran. Special thanks to Jane Wynn, Catherine Wynn, Tina Pham, Sydney Jamie, and Christo Trin. Please find us on Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok at The Vietnamese Podcast. You can also find us on YouTube where you can subscribe, like, and comment. Please rate and give us a review wherever you find our podcasts.